Sydney has been reeling this week after two horrific attacks. Both the Bondi Junction and the Wakeley attacks have raised a whole range of difficult questions around terrorism, around mental illness, the spread of misinformation on social media and, of course, community cohesion. There's also a big question over the safety of women which is what I'm keen to focus on in this conversation. The Bondi Junction attacker Joel Couchy killed five women and one male security guard. The majority of those injured in the attack were also women. And the New South Wales Police Commissioner said it's pretty obvious that he was targeting women. Now, this attack may not have been declared an act of terrorism, but it certainly was terrifying. And that's certainly the case for women in particular. And I'm keen to explore whether this aspect of this horrific attack is likely to bring about any policy change as a result. I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders on Background. Michaela Cronin is Australia's Domestic Family and Sexual Violence Commissioner. Michaela, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, David. So before we get to what happened at Bondi Junction, perhaps it's worth just laying out the scale of the problem when it comes to gender-based violence in Australia. How big a problem is this and is it getting any better or any worse at the moment? David, it's a really significant problem um, and what we've, we've seen uh, a increasing public attention on the number of women who've been murdered in their intimate relationships, often after they've left those relationships. I think that the, we have a 10-year national plan to address violence against women and children, which indicates that the, the scale of the problem is absolutely understood by government. The Commonwealth and all jurisdictions have signed up to that plan and invested very significantly. We've seen this is actually the second 10-year plan. The first one saw the establishment of ANROSE, the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, and our watch, the national organisation to address prevention efforts uh, to, to look at what is it we need to do to prevent these levels of violence. We, and we know, sorry, I'll, sorry I'll, I'll, and, I, and I will come back to um, what's happening with that plan and, and whether new directions, new efforts need to be uh, pursued. But, but perhaps um, just looking then at Bondi Junction, when we saw some of those scenes, when we saw who'd been killed, who'd been injured, uh, women in particular, what did you think? I think all of us were watching the footage and it increasingly dawned on us that he was targeting women. It looked very much like he was targeting women and avoiding men. And uh, it was very distressing to see that and watch that emerge and to realise how terrified those women and um, everybody in the shopping centre must be. And given some of the statistics you were just talking about, did, did that sort of thing surprise you, that women would be targeted, would be a focus in, in such an event? No, it didn't surprise me. It did, uh, I did, you know, increasingly become alarmed about what, what was, as I think we've all been questioning, what was the motivation? What was the motivation behind the attack and what was actually going on on that Saturday afternoon? Well, I guess that's hard to know, right? I mean, um, the offender's dead. Uh, police are going to spend a lot of time going through, you know, talking to those close to him, what he was up to, social media, all of those sort of things. But ultimately, it's it's pretty hard to nail down the exact motivation here, isn't it? Oh, I think it's very difficult. I, I think that ultimately, you're right, we're never going to know what was in his mind at the time um, because he's no longer with us and we can't, we can't talk to him about what was in his mm. mind. There is a debate, though, about whether this particular uh, attack should have been or should be declared an act of terrorism. Um, now, terrorism in Australia is defined as something that's been politically, religiously or ideologically motivated. Do you think this fits into that category? Look, I think... Uh, no, I don't. I don't think it does. I think what we need to be thinking about in in the way this incident is labelled is how it's... how What are the tools available to investigate it appropriately? And then what is it we need to learn from it in how could we prevent it going forward? I think that... Uh, uh, so, I think that the police have absolutely responded incredibly well and appropriately and that everybody in the community has taken it seriously. So I don't know that extra resources were required in terms of the immediate mm -hmm. response and the immediate, the, the, the way that the police responded, I do think we need to think about what are the lessons. 
Nonetheless, there is this debate. I mean, putting aside this particular case in, in Bondi Junction, there is a debate about whether uh, a, a attacks on women, if they are motivated by misogyny, um, incel ideology, as it's called, or hatred of women, uh, whether that should be defined as an act of terrorism. There was a case in, in Canada back in, um, just in November, uh, a young man was actually um, convicted of a terrorism offence for an incel ideologically inspired uh, attack, a fatal stabbing of a woman. We haven't seen that in Australia. Do you think that, that sort of attack should be called terrorism? I, I think that that's a really important debate for us to have as a community and to be... Uh to be looking at what what the, the benefits and the risks associated with doing that are. I think we need, absolutely, we need increased uh, attention into attacks and to be aware that attacks like that are likely to increase. They are increasing across the world um, and to make sure that we have the appropriate tools in place to both respond in the moment when incidents like that occur and, as I said, to be learning and to be thinking about ahead of time, how can we prevent them? Mm. You, you said there, I think, that you have to consider the risks and benefits in calling a, um, a, a, an attack motivated by hatred of women terrorism. W what are the risks and benefits, do you think? I think one of the risks, David, is to focus on one single risk factor. It clearly, absolutely is an important risk factor to be considered and examined, but there are many other risk factors that we need to make sure we keep in mind to be thinking about how we respond and prevent. For mm. example, one of the things that's being talked about in terms of Saturday's attack is the mental health factors and what, what could have been done to address those um, in attacks like that. So when we look then at uh, the lesson that can be learned from what happened at Bondi Junction, what would you say is the most or are the most important lessons? I, I think that uh, I mean I think that that one of the lessons is is around just how well the response um, has been on on many fronts from from the police um, who were present and the incredible you know bravery and courage of people who were there. I think the care, and attention for all the people who are deeply traumatised, the very personal losses of those who have lost family and friends and the care, thinking about the trauma that all of the people who um, are associated with will experience. And again, I think there's been very good response around that. I think the lessons in terms of the way that people leapt on to the, what happened in social media about attributing blame, attributing motivations and um, was we are seeing unfold just how incorrect and damaging some of that was. So I think one of the lessons is to take time uh, and be thoughtful about understanding what what led to the attack in ways that we can then think about preventing, prevention. Well, let's explore that, uh, you know, because you talk about the tools that we need to try and prevent these sorts of things. Um, and I think you mentioned we're likely to see a further increase in these sorts of attacks targeting women. What are the tools that we need to deploy? I think one of the reasons that I'm saying I think we'll, where I'm concerned that we'll see increasing attacks is what's happening on um, online. So the, we, we're seeing a generation of young men who have been exposed to uh, pornography and uh, misogyny online in ways that we've never seen before. I think the work of the eSafety Commissioner around uh, regulating that space, regulating the what what is online in social media, is it is a really critical tool. And Australia is leading the way in the work that the eSafety Commissioner is doing in that space. I think that's an increased risk factor for the generation of young men that we are seeing and some of the tools that we need to be addressing that are education in schools very get supporting young men in both tackling the misogyny that they are being bombarded with online and also supporting them in understanding what healthy masculinity is and good relationships are so i think that's why I'm saying there's a range of tools, as well as uh, clearly some of the issues around addressing and supporting um, mental health issues. So there's a broad range of tools we need. 
I think it's really interesting um, what what you're saying here. Your concern is, your belief is, that the younger generation of boys and men, the the um, exposure they have to pornography and misogyny online, uh, is going to, unless we change something, is going to lead to more horrific attacks on women. Well, I think that that's absolutely part of what we're seeing happening. I think it's it's part of the 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 landscape of. Um, I mean, we've with the, there's increasing research about uh, about young men's attitudes to young women. What we're seeing about um, the need to be educating about inf- not only informed but active consent. Uh, the increase in um, choking and strangulation as a result of responses as a result of the pornography people are seeing online. Mm. I absolutely think we've got increased risk risk factors there. So you talk about we need better education at school. I mean, parents, families uh, clearly have to play a role here too. But ultimately, is it possible to stop um, this sort of material being, being viewed, being accessed by young men? Look, there are there are all sorts of mechanisms that the government and the safety commission, as I said, are looking at about how they and they have got some incredible tools about both uh, tracking and taking things down, but also the, the platforms have a responsibility. I, I, I agree with you that everybody has a responsibility to play. Platforms have a responsibility about what they what material is being generated and shared, and and the algorithms that mean that those are pushed out. Uh, rapidly um, and inappropriately targeting um, children, young children who are seeing pornography just pop up on their screens. Um, I think there are absolutely tools that we can use to to restrict and prevent that happening. Yeah, I mean, this brings us back to, I guess, the policy uh, response that should flow from something like this. I mean, you, you mentioned at the outset the, the 10-year plan uh, on domestic and family violence that's underway. Is that... Is that in need, do you think, of any sort of uh, uh, immediate change to, to factor in some of these issues? I think that we've got a good plan. I think that what we need to do, there's a whole range of... I mean, it's incredibly complex. There needs to be better coordination across portfolios. So we, in this conversation, David, we've talked across health portfolio, family, mm. community services, policing... Communications. Uh, communications. It's very, it, it's very complex, and all of those policy areas and portfolios need to be aware of what each other are doing and and coordinating responses in ways that I think there is absolutely room for improvement. And, and at a state and federal level, um, do you see that happening? That coordination. I what I see is increasing uh, willingness to coordinate, I think, and, and intentions too. I think I'm seeing some really good efforts across, uh, across, across the Department of Social Services and Attorney Generals to be looking at how they, how they can coordinate. Uh, I think we need to see improved action in that regard as well. What about the social media companies? I mean, frankly, do you have much confidence in, in these social media companies doing much, to, much about this? I, I think the, 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 the carrot and stick approach that government are taking and um, Julianne Mungrat, the safety commissioner, I would absolutely back them in and support the efforts that they're making. Should they, um, and this is a, a blunt question, I suppose, should they be held in any way culpable for the sort of attacks that we're talking about here, those social media companies? I think that they have a responsibility like like others do and I and I think they have a significant responsibility in in being aware of the impact of what what is happening on their platforms yes. Michaela, let me ask you while I've got you here about another big story during the week, very big story indeed, and that was Bruce Lehrman uh, losing his defamation case against Channel 10 and Lisa Wilkinson. Federal court judges found he did rape Brittany Higgins. Look, this saga, um, as everyone knows, has, has been going for years. It involved an aborted criminal trial, inquiries, various defamation proceedings. It's been incredibly messy, incredibly costly, and um, no doubt traumatic for those involved. What is the significance of of this moment, this finding by a federal court judge in a civil case, in in your view? I think there's incredible um, significance, not only in the finding, but in but in um, in the judge's deliberations and the way he has approached it. I think one of the things that's really significant is 
the way that he talked about the impact of trauma and his understanding of the impact of trauma um, is is very significant. I think that an understanding of the impact that uh, what these four years have been on Brittany Higgins and the trauma that she has experienced um, is is very significant. I think it comes at the end of a very long traumatic process um, that many in the community have been very distressed to watch. And do you think a lot of women out there who have been victims uh, of, of sexual violence or gender-based violence would look at all of this and think, why would, why would I possibly want to go through all of that? What would be your message to them? Look, I think, uh, absolutely, David. I started out as a, as a sexual assault counsellor over 30 years ago, and I remember at the time thinking I wouldn't want anybody I loved or cared for to go through the justice system because many of the women, and many of the women that I talk to today, uh, come and tell me about their stories because they don't want other women to experience what they have going through the justice system. The Attorney General has put in place an Australian Law Reform Commission inquiry into justice responses to sexual violence. Um, and I think that is absolutely critical and necessary because we're, we're not seeing um, good responses to women who are bringing forward their experiences of sexual violence. My, my message to those young women or women of any age um, uh, would be to, to talk to the people that the supports that they have in their lives, um, to, to seek out support and information, to be well armed with information about what it is that they're going into and the supports that they need so that they're aware of what they're taking on. Yeah, a very, uh, very sage advice indeed. Uh, Michaela Cronin, Australia's Domestic Family and Sexual Violence Commissioner, really good to talk to you today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Now, we're keen for your thoughts on this conversation and suggestions for the podcast uh, as well. Please rate, review and subscribe wherever you're listening to this. And if you've got an idea for a topic you'd like us to explore, uh, please send us an email, insiders at abc.net.au. Thanks for those who've already done so. We'll be back in your feed next week and I'll see you Sunday morning for Insiders. Bye for now. Making us all feel very excited about being here.